Okay. How about some questions? Let's play. Okay. I need some answers because I have a friend of mine who's writing something and he needs a couple of good answers. Could you read it? Read it? Yes. Please. What is the Logos? And how does it relate to our work in philosophy and dream work? And how does it relate to the dream master? Yeah. Uh, that was a good answer. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> I want to say, I want to know, like, um, what is the function of the dreams? Because it seems like the function of the logos comes from the dream master or the self. More. Um, It seems to be very important, um, very significant, very meaningful. It's like all your answers would be in the logos. But that only happens in uh, Southern California. <laughs> <laughs> no. No? Mm -mm. Oh, only today. No, all the time. Okay. All the time? That's a long time. Infinite. It's infinite. Oh, 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 oh. So it's some continuous, important, meaningful influence of the Logos upon the Dream Master mm. and therefore upon by contrast as it, as it is exhibited in our work in philosophy and dream work. Is that right? I would say uh, yes. uh, Julie, do you agree with that? You know, I, my mind was off. <laughs> I don't mind. I'm thinking about other things, mm. but um, I'm sure I would agree with what Belinda said because I always agree with what Belinda said. <laughs> 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 so, yes, I, I like to put my money on a winner. <laughs> so she, was, she was actually saying that you had a great definition of the logos. Great partner. Belinda was saying that she had a great definition and we should ask her. So, since she agrees with her, she should now provide an answer to what the logos is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The logos? Oh, I meant Julie, but... Oh, <laughs> you Julie. You get a great answer. Thank you, Belinda. Yeah. <laughs> okay, who's answering, me or Julie? <laughs> <laughs> I'll agree with you. Oh, that's my job. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what makes? Greek philosophy singularly different than all other religious and philosophical systems is exclusively <laughs> the Logos. Because it offers up that it's there for all, all to participate in? 
Is there any connection between uh, this? Should I also add another word here? And in the dialectic? How important is the idea of the Logos in terms of the Parmenides? Yes. It's, what? It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's the language of the Parmenides. Is that clear? It wasn't to me, but I was hoping it would be clear to you. Well, ask him about it. What do you want to ask him? Like, yeah, um, say more about it. Come on. I mean, it's, it's like the, 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 the framework by which we um, reason. Mm. Yes, it is the language of reason. Yeah. That's good, isn't it? The language of reason, yeah. 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 On what level? Uh, the highest. Oh, 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 oh. Well, it's like a framework, too. Yeah, it's like a knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of self. What, what? The knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of the self. Ah, understanding, wisdom. So isn't that the metaphysical level? Mm -hmm. the, yeah. Where that takes place, the wisdom and Good. understanding? Good. Uh, it provides order, symmetry. Order, symmetry. Mm -hmm. But not a, not things like an allergy. Mm. Oh yeah, that's that's its best. also mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah. its best act. Yeah. An allegory. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Oh metaphor. my goodness. Yeah. Assembly. And similar. Unity. And metaphor. Good oh, heavens. It's pretty busy. <laughs> <laughs> Look. Yeah. <laughs> what is the origin of the logos? Is it? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Who's the? I like that. I was going to say the one in the self, but I like her answer. Uh, of Sia. likely to be, well, I really need something more. Yeah, Dom, what were you going to say? I was going to say the one. Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> what is the origin? The good itself. Mm. Inherent, inherent in the brilliant light of being is the logos. Hmm. The intelligibility of the brilliant light of being is because of the presence internally to it of the logos. Therefore, when you people are having experiences and dreams about beauty and all of these nice states of mind, what are you participating in? You're getting close to this experience. Right? Therefore, it's a precursor to this kind of experience of the brilliant light of being. Because that experience itself is a vital insight. See? It itself 
the experience itself is an insight, is the use of the mind to know the mind, mm -hmm. or the self coming to see the self. Mm -hmm. right. So therefore we can say it has a dynamic <laughs> of turning upon itself and knowing itself, and its intelligibility is the logos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is, I think you actually put that before for us. You said the logos is not because of the intelligibility. I believe you said the logos is the intelligibility right. it is of the, the most brilliant of mind. Of the brilliant mind of being. So if, okay, good. Yeah. So if that's the case, then is that intelligibility the object of Lucia? Yes. Because Lucia is the reflective capacity of turning upon itself to and know itself. And that's the highest object. And of that's Lucia. the highest object of experience. Of experience. Yeah. Because once you get into this realm, that is beyond all possible experience. Mm -hmm. Curious stuff? Yeah. So, when you're driving, don't get in that state. <laughs> but I'm, I'm curious as to your earlier question, here. So if the Logos is the intellig inherent intelligibility of the brilliant light of being, and is the object of Lucia, which is the highest experience, Yeah, go ahead. Second it's, highest, next to the self. Yes, it's itself. the highest possible experience. Experience, right? Um, and if your question earlier was, what is the origin of that? Mm -hmm. Did we get an answer? It all depends upon what you call an answer. <laughs> <laughs> If there is still some doubt or lack, then you're on the you're making a connection that there is still something left that needs to be said, whether it continues this or it needs another way of approaching. So we're looking for people who can say, "Wow, well, this is curious, but I think it goes somewhere else." And you would say. Um. Well, uh, well Pierre, Pierre asked us, what is the origin of the Logos, the origin of this inherent intelligibility of the brilliant light of being? So, having defined what it is, now he wants to know the origin of this inherent intelligibility. Sure. Well, if the brilliant light of being and its intelligibility is the highest experience of which our self-reflection, our Lucia, can participate in or mm -hmm. search for, mm -hmm. and now we're asking for an origin of that, right -o. then Pierre is asking, well, that must mean that someone might take the position that uh, it goes somewhere else and decides where we've been. <laughs> well, so if, you, if you happen to know some people who got into this experience or you've read about it, that's enough. Can you not say that some people, when they try to give an account of this experience, often call it mind itself? Yes. And mind itself is another way of talking about the intelligibility of the brilliant light of being. But if you go further and say, what is it that can bring someone to, to experience it in the game we're in, that's the dialectic of the Parmenides. Mm -hmm. By using the mind, you're exercising the mind and preparing it for higher states of mind. Therefore, it, have a good trip. <laughs> <laughs> Is intelligibility a real being? Yes, same thing. 
because people who experience this also say, oh my God, it can't be anything more real than this. This is reality. Mm. Like in the symposium, that experience of beauty itself, you know, uh, the Rouse has it, he touches reality. Mm. But in the Greek, it's he touches truth. Mm. Because in that experience, people also say, hey, that's the nature of truth. So in a way, these are synonyms that are pointing to certain aspects of that experience and the nature of that experience. So you collect those all together. Are you then defining the Logos? Unpacking the intelligibility of the brilliant light of being as the Logos through the dialectic and the exploration of this curious game of philosophy vis-a-vis through the pop of Well, that's all beautiful, but... <laughs> that's, a, that's why we need you. The but is what we need. Since I am known as, as, as Rufus the Tenacious, I will stick with your beautiful question of origin. Mm. Origin of this. Yes, I like that. Yeah. Very different from the words that the Catholic Church uses, for example. Mm. So is it... Oh, sorry, Julia, go ahead. Well, so, just the words. Uh, if you compare the words of Plato with the words of the Catholic Church, the logos are very different. And I don't even know if I'd call it logos. Um, well... Yeah. The Logos in the Gospel of John ends up being belief. Mm. And that's not this. <laughs> Which is no Logos <laughs> at all. <laughs> but, can, can I jump? Oh, a faulty interpretation. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So to ask about the origin of the Logos, Logos being the inherent intelligibility of divine luminosity, and that itself just being one aspect of divine luminosity, a, a real being, mm -hmm. is to really ask for the origin of divine luminosity itself. Yeah. Ah, that's such a better question. Go <laughs> Jeff. See, that's the great mystery. Look, given the idea, uh, we'll use this idea as the one self. Mm -hmm. See, in the Parmenides, Parmenides' is hypothesis, his own hypothesis, is one self, because in the Parmenides, he then details what he means by the one, mm -hmm. and they're all negatives. Then he takes these negatives, as it were, and says, assigns them to the self, and that's why he gets the idea of one self. So what? When you get all of these negatives, that's the sometimes called the dia negativa, uh, that nature of God about which you can say nothing. But the question is, if these are all negatives, that is, empty of all expressions, or empty of all categories, which is why in Plotinus he says that's nothing, right? Idea of nothing. <laughs> How can this produce this? Yeah. Wait. Yeah. <laughs> Eso. Yeah. And, uh, uh, my friend Harry Dobivich McGee, who's one of the great scholars in, from Romania, uh, he convinced me that he had no idea of it. And he was my teacher, which is why I don't have any idea either. <laughs> now this is, the big, this is the biggest mystery there is. This, is this not the question of, uh, or the class of questions that uh, we call first First co primal causes, first cause, iamblichus, damascus, and all this? No, no, do it again. 
These are the questions that I am with his takes up. Yes. Which is? What you just laid out. What I just laid out, yeah. If all you got is the D of negativity, yeah. Yeah. Tiva, how do you get there from, from all of nothing to all of everything? Yeah. So what's worse about this These are the hypotheses and the Parmenides. There is a, see, there is no explanation for this. Therefore, there's a gap. Mm -hmm. By the way, there's also a gap between every successive mm -hmm. hypothesis. Same thing for the negative side. So the idea of trying to explain each one of these in terms of its origin is always a blooming mystery. <laughs> What's worse? Okay, go one more step. But actually, these don't exist. As you proceed upward, it absorbs everything that was prior to it. And therefore, what you really have is a progressive bringing up until you finally get that first hypothesis. So the idea of the gap is central both internal to the third hypothesis and to each one of them. There's a gap. A profound one. What? Yeah, yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'd be I'd be very interested in the demonstration. And by the way, of all of those absorptions as you go up, uh, the choicest demonstration for me, I guess, would be to see how uh, that number one, about which nothing can be said, could possibly absorb everything. Well, it absorbs it only in one sense. Uh, it does away with the need for it. Would you agree the fourth is the easiest one to talk about because that, in its totality, includes all belief systems? Yes. Right. When you see the emptiness of the fourth, you don't bring it with you to the third. It's gone. So successively, each of these, as you proceed upward, the prior vanishes having any import on the totality. It's transcended. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why it's an interesting piece of work. Hmm. I know some people have been in it for a while. Very interesting. <laughs> I bet so, you don't believe that. No, I do. Actually. All right, okay. I was telling my mom about it. <laughs> so, Plato brings up that we already have this art within us to turn us about towards this way of thinking and reasoning, to turn us back to real beings and away from the world of becoming. I wish that were true. <laughs> so you don't agree with that? That we already have it no, born within no, us? Or said we have the, the potentiality for it. Uh, that one I, I could agree with. That it's not going on at all times? Like the Logos just took a break? Or it's always happening? Or? It's always happening, but we're talking about how accessible is it to us. So this is what I really liked about Maria's dream earlier. She brought up like how to let something happen. Yeah. The receptivity, so we have the giver and the receiver, and we are the receiver of the Logos. And she was discussing a state of mind that, where she let herself will yeah. open up. That's pretty amazing to me. Yes, that it sounds is. like it the is. kind of state that we're asking about oh. that is going beyond and allowing something to come in at that moment. So, I was thinking she could... That's well said, is it not? Yeah. So I was wondering of, like, about that. Yeah, so? I thought you were away. No, I just. Oh, okay. Trying to see. Sometimes people <laughs> wait. Like yes, yeah, please. So if we can't talk about it, how can we advocate for the for that the good itself? If we can't if we can't express ourselves, how can we we 
we talk about? How can we advocate for, for that? Hmm. Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, to those who aren't pos part of this kind of a dialogue, you can't. Or it's very difficult, or right? I dare say perhaps impossible. That was your question, Jed, right? See, uh, <clears throat> people who experience this see it as the ultimate. Mm -hmm. And remember that story that happened with me. Some of you were present. Uh, I was giving a talk in, in London and these people were involved in, uh, interested in the dream, I, it's dreams, and I was doing a demonstration of dream work, and uh, they were very upset about it because <clears throat> we identified this gentleman's problem as being fundamentally, he was English, and being in English has a certain persona and he identified completely with it, and that was his problem. They were saying, you're saying being English is a problem. I said, no, being Jewish is a problem. Being French is a problem. Being anything other than the, yourself is a problem. They didn't like that a bit. So after a short while, they brought up a, a guy, and he was, and he was in the middle of a, one of the Christian conversion experiences. And on top of it, kind of he was floating in and out of the state. Mm. And they wanted me to deal with him. Mm. And I didn't know what to do, but I said, uh, <clears throat> uh, had a pen in my pocket. Uh, say, is there a cause for this? Mm. Huh? Yes. Oh. Is there a cause for this or just come into being spontaneously? Huh? Huh? I have to think about that. Okay. Uh, cause. <laughs> okay. Ah, causes? Is there a cause for everything? Uh, Wait a minute. Is there also a cause for even every experience you have? Hmm. And the gentleman said, yes, that's true. And I said, well, the thing you're experiencing right now must have a cause, and the cause must be higher than that. He went, mm. and he lost everything that he was in. Mm. He literally turned white, you know, <laughs> and uh, he committed suicide that night, and they blamed it on me. Mm -hmm. Moral of the story, uh, when you challenge someone who's in this, it may have curious consequences. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Sir, time to quit. Is transcendency different or the same as cause? Pardon? Is transcendence, say, yes. Of yes. each of these over the other, the same or different from cause? Well, uh, I don't see that they're related. Uh, neither do I. That's why I was asking. Because tenacious as I am, I still want an answer. <laughs> <laughs> and I have to know what answers a question. Yeah. Like, I always have a way out of this that you guys don't have. When I get in this state, I just ask Nancy. <laughs> right? Uh, well, but go back to it. Come on, stay well, on it. I think we can answer that question, though. Isn't it you're asking him to give an answer to the source of intelligibility? Yeah. Well, isn't that beyond intelligibility? So you want him to, like, bring the... Uh, I mean, and you've, you've given hints a few times, of like, it's a mystery. It's one of the great mysteries. No, no, that's not the yeah. mystery. Wait a minute. You call it the greatest mystery. The, the, cause, the cause or the conditions that brought this into existence is a mystery. And a mystery... Not the participation in it. And a mystery is, by definition, something that we don't know? Yes. Like, yes. But wonder about. Mm -hmm. um, so, 
But only in the logos, because you don't like that. if you're in it, <laughs> no, if you're in that state of mind, you're in something. No, you're absolutely right. And there's one word we're leaving out, and that uh, <clears throat> uh, in the Parmenides he, he uses a word, and he calls it uh, touching. Mm-hmm. And that's not the right word, of course, because uh, this experience, is, curiously enough, is the most intimate mm. experience, because it's encountering yourself on the highest level. And that is intimate, because the object then becomes an object worthy of love. Mm-hmm. Therefore, love has to be part of this picture. Because anyone who experiences it can help immediately falling in love with that brilliant light of being. And that's pretty good. That was a joke. Did you get it? It was pretty good. (laughs) Okay. But it still doesn't like, suppose, Josh, suppose we take these answers as good. Okay, so uh, ain't nothing, I mean, you can't, I mean, this is... Second hypothesis is as high as you can get in terms of experience and intelligibility. So yes. we can't ask what caused it. Of course you can. But uh, we could go down instead of up. Sure. I'd, I'd be satisfied uh, with another exercise. Uh, what's what's the cause for three? Cause for the, for uh, the gap. The third hypothesis. Oh. Oh. If not the second. Right? Two successive moments. If each moment is separate from the next, or if time is not continuous, it's discontinuous. If it's discontinuous, then there must be a gap between each moment. Now, uh, something curious happens here. What accounts for something quite amazing? There must be something new that fits uniquely with what's going on and it fits exactly with the past. Equally well, there must be something that's dropping away What accounts for that? It's amazing with such precision. Dropping away in what way? So, Plato argues in the third hypothesis that this is what is called the gap. And This gap has to have all the intelligibility in order to ensure that it fits perfectly, that it can unite with the past so that there's a continuity. So it must have an amazing fit. Mm -hmm. 
Therefore, there must be some intelligibility found in the gap, or through the gap, the intelligibility functions. Uh, the logos. And therefore, it operates eternally, providing the connection between each successive moment. And that's why, by the way, you ever Ever know anyone who does a lot of woodworking in the garage? There's stuff all around the floor. They got to clean it up all the time. Yeah. Say, with all the changes that take place, why don't we see the junk all over the place? <laughs> right? Where's the junk? For Plato, it's into this and out of this, all change takes place. So all that necessarily changes, that as it were, is absorbed and develops continuously. So you can talk about this as the basic paradigm, the paradigm of creation or you can call it a, the paradigm. And the paradigm is another use of the word model, highest model, which we're talking about as the logos. So, third hypothesis is really great hypothesis. So we can see evidence of the second uh, and perhaps arguably even right. the first, That's operating right. in, in the gap of the third. That's right. But in other words, you're quite right. If you want to study this by itself, yeah. that's the second hypothesis. Uh, but we still have not answered how this whole system got set up. That's because I didn't go to the right school. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'll look for another school. Well, I mean, we're looking for intelligibility, are we not? Watch. Yeah. Uh -huh. And we've, we've had a few uh, uh, people come before us in this game. But, see, the question of whether or not the intelligibility is the way we described it a moment ago, right? Is there, is there a, what appears to be differences, and do the differences vanish as one proceeds up to the highest goal? Doesn't exist. Any. Like, is it possible for someone to finally get out of the fourth hypothesis, which we often call the home of all belief systems. Does it still exist for you or for the person who gets out of it? No. They're out of it. If that's true for the fourth to the third, so equally for the rest of them. So where does the notion of the good itself fit into this paradigm? Oh, the cause of the paradigm is the good itself. Mm, okay. And none of the changes could happen if they weren't for good. <laughs> well, that paradigm is then called the idea of the mind of God at the moment of creation. Okay, take a break. We're going to say happy? I need something. Yeah, we're happy. I know. Oh, no, actually, I'm jealous because it looks like Oralia got an answer. Oh, well, yeah. that's Oralia. <laughs> <laughs> she said no. <laughs> I'm not happy with the good being the cause because we've all, I, any more than I'm happy with Plotinus saying the good overflows because we've already, in the first hypothesis, no, of course. understood that it has no Wait boundary. Wait a minute, it has no can make it worse. There's nothing you can say about it, so how could it cause and anything? And therefore it couldn't cause anything. Right, you know? 
But it does, that's the only thing that is. Uh -huh. If this is true. Another curiosity I have is that uh, could those successive moments be um, uh, in God's be well in okay could those successive moments be lifetimes and a gap be if when we pass and we come back again we remember like Plato says sure mm. so you can put it in that way mm. yeah. you can see it in a variety of ways and places yeah. I want to get something in the <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, dear. My pleasure. <laughs>